This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, uh, Tim, for that um, extensive introduction. So I will not be talking about ADAPTN today. I will be talking about uh, soil health, which is uh, another very exciting topic. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, focus on sort of uh, bigger picture issues because I believe that we need to understand that in order to be able to think about how we can sort of address some of the current issues. Um, so just as a quick introduction, and you know, we've talked about soil health in the past, so I'm not gonna uh, go down too far, but it basically relates to functioning of the soil, the capacity to function, kind of like with human health, it's an, it's an equivalent. And so some of these functions include supporting plant growth and thereby crops. Uh, some of it is uh, being an excellent habitat for organisms, being an, uh, an hy a hydrological and environmental buffer, things like that, okay? Um, and I often like to start out with this diagram that sort of shows how we as humans are impacted by soil health through maybe two major pathways. One is sort of the agriculture and nutrition, uh, and the other one is more the ecosystem services and the environmental impacts, issues like um, climate change or water quality, uh, et cetera. Today I wanna explore a little bit more how we as humans are also impacting uh, soil health. So the arrow going the other way. Um, so the other thing that's been really exciting about soil health, and um, we started a major effort here at Cornell with uh, George Abawi and Dave Wolf in uh, uh, about 18 years ago, I think it was. And uh, what it brought together is, is the, the three major supporting uh, disciplines in soil science. And so ended up working with soil chemists, worked with Murray McBride and Hannah and people like that with Janice Tees and now Dan Buckley, Dave Wolf, and George Abawi. And you know, I really come out of the, the physical area. But one of the ideas initially was uh, to say, well, we really did a very good job with nutrients and pH or the, the, the chemical aspects, but the physical and, and biological aspects are not very well addressed. So that brought us to developing a soil health test, basically sort of a standard test it's made up of chemical, physical, and biological indicators. And um, these were selected based on their general utility, cost, and, and all that. And uh, we're now uh, in the soil health lab in this building. We're now processing several thousands of samples annually from basically all over the world. And uh, it has sort of become one of the standards for soil health uh, assessment. And, uh, and uh, we've tweaked it a little bit over the years, but they've largely held up as being really good indicators. And I'll show you some results later on. But I wanna start at a very foundational level first. And that's really what soils made up, uh, uh, what, what makes up soils. And, and there's really um, a few very basic ingredients that make soil. So one is the minerals, it's typically weathered geological material biological material, and then water, air, and sun as the other major ingredients. And that basically, the water dissolves the mineral, the, uh, uh, the crystals and, 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 and dissolves the minerals, makes nutrients available. Um, uh, some of those nutrients um, are biologically, hydrogen notably derived. And you need water, air, and sun, you need carbon dioxide, you need oxygen, you need water to grow plants and to have the plants to feed other organisms, et cetera, et cetera. And that's sort of what on earth at least makes the soils uh, very special. And uh, we end up with this sort of accumulation of um, carbon and minerals. So in the natural soil formation, this is really a very efficient system. You know, most of the minerals that are being dissolved by chemical weathering are being absorbed through roots by plants and then feed other organisms, okay? So most of the minerals dissolved end up actually in some type of organic material if they're not being absorbed by the soil, but very low loss uh, rates. So the organics, the carbon, either builds up in the soil, uh, especially here, you see that, in the forest-derived soil, or um, they're being recycled. You know, either directly plant material being recycled or recycled through some other organism, okay? Um, but in natural system, you basically have an accumulation over time of minerals and carbon in the organic matter, right? And that sort of uh, creates a, you might say, a bank account 
of stored energy and minerals. So an example of a highly successful uh, uh, type of soil health formation are these periglacial lush soils under grassland vegetation, which you find in sort of what's now you know, most of the, the corn belt. Uh, lush soils are wind derived, very fresh material uh, from recent glaciation. Grassland soils are very efficient with capturing the energy from the sun and the water and then pumping a lot of carbon into that soil. So you get these very deep mollusks that are really you know, fantastic, uh, a, a success story in terms of soil health, soil health formation. And around the world, we have uh, a lot of similar soils like that. We know uh, the soils here, you know, we think of Iowa and places like that. Um, but you know, China and Ukraine, uh, uh, Central Europe, even in South America, you have similar soils. And believe me, a lot of wars have been fought over controlling those kind of lands because they are the most productive soils. So if you look at, so this accumulation of minerals and carbon, right? And so here the carbon is, is organic C and the minerals, I just show the phosphorus. Um, so these are five soils in, in Indiana. It's a relatively old publication. I like to do some back of the envelope calculations of what does this really mean? Uh, what's in those soils? Well, there's about 3,000 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare in the, in the top foot of those soils in terms of phosphorus that's either in organic form or some other non-crystalline absorbed form. And so for the entire root zone, that may be about double that. And when you think of a corn, a seasonal corn uh, plant requires about 40 to 50 kilograms. So you kind of think about this being a bank of minerals that you can draw out of, you know, you have a good hundred years maybe that you could draw out of that, okay? Not that we necessarily want to do that, but it's, it's there, right? Uh, so that's why these soils are productive and have been relatively productive for a long time. So as opposed to those soils, we also have what we might call marginally successful soil health formation. And um, so this is a Cecil soil from the Southeast in the United States. And uh, most of the minerals have already been leached out because these are old soils. The remaining minerals are a lot of iron and aluminum oxides. Um, the, they were porous derived, so not that much organic matter. In fact, a lot of it has been lost through uh, erosion and all that. So this is a not so good soil. And so you can map that and you look at a picture like that and you see, okay, um, you see that most of these soils that have a lot of phosphorus uh, tend to be in these periglacial, more northern areas where there's more uh, organic matter in the soil and, and it's much poorer in the in the southern areas, with the exception of the Mississippi River Valley. But of course, that's the good stuff that comes down the river, right? So we'll come back to that later. So in this, of course, you can, uh, you can upscale that to a global level. Uh, we tend to be blessed with very good soils in this part of the world, and most of the rest of the world has soils more like this. This is a, uh, some uh, soils from Brazil. And so, um, you know, a lot of, not a lot of useful nutrients, relatively low organic matter content. So that's when uh, you have a situation where you can maybe get a couple of years of crop production out of them and then you have to abandon the land, which kind of stimulated this whole idea of shifting cultivation. Two, three years of crops, 30, 40 years of putting it back and letting the natural soil forming processes uh, um, build a little bit of fertility and then you have another two or three years, right? So it's very different than the situation in say uh, the Midwest. So, and of course we started to develop these soils, agricultural development. So we removed the surface vegetation and um, so that's some of the carbon, but then also of course we till the soil, we stimulate organic matter decomposition, which is great because it releases the nutrients, but it's not so great because you're basically drawing out of your bank account, right? Um, and in addition, we have this physical degradation of the soil. And so your erosion and all that. So not only are you kind of burning up the organic matter and using the nutrients, some of them are actually physically removed off your field and goes elsewhere, okay? And this is much more of a problem in hotter climates, sort of forest-derived soils that basically aren't that good to start out with, okay? 
So, and these soils, because we're growing plants, typically when we're growing crops, a lot of times it's annual plants. And so for a large part of the year, there's no active plant growth and the soil forming processes are not that efficient. So basically we're not using the basic resources of water, sun, and minerals as efficiently and we have a lot more losses, right? Uh, much of the minerals and energy because of agriculture, we remove them. We typically harvest, you know, 50 to 60% of the biomass and even more of the minerals. We're recycling a little bit through residues or maybe manures, but a lot of it gets lost. And so we're effectively mining these soils, right? That's what agriculture uh, has done. And it results in nutrient and carbon depletion. And like I said, uh, basically the need for uh, discontinuous production. So here's some data um, from uh, Kirsten Kurtz. And many of you know her, she's in the, in the audience, she's sitting right there. She manages the soil health lab. She's also working on a master's um, uh, program with uh, Rebecca Snyder and Steve Moriale, um, her minor advisor. And what she has uh, done is sampled uh, some soils, natural uh, soils as much as possible, prairie soils in the Western Corn Belt, and then uh, sampling co-sampling at agricultural sites that were right nearby, kind of a site-by-site -site comparison. And this is some very preliminary data. She's doing a lot of uh, soil health analyses. This is just organic matter, and it shows how much loss of organic matter there's been in an area that's been in production maybe for less than 150 years, okay? So often, you know, two, three, four percent organic matter losses. And this project is in the context of some work in China that Rebecca and Steve started in an area in northwestern China where we, in a way, have a similar ecological, agroecological environment, but many more years of intensive land degradation. It's really quite extreme, kind of dust bowl-like. Okay, so that brings me to this issue of the geography and the history. Part of my thinking started um, a few years ago when uh, Aubrey Fine, who uh, got her master's degree with Indeed Martinez, and then worked for me for a year or two or whatever. And so Aubrey's a very, very smart lady. And so I asked her to do some statistical analysis. So she did some multivariate work and all that. But I also asked her to do a regional comparison of the soils in our soil health database from the many thousands of samples that we had, had uh, analyzed and compare those three regions, the Midwest, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Northeast. <coughs> and so based on what I just said about soil development and, and why some soils are better than other ones, which one would you expect to have the best results in terms of soil health, right? Obviously you would say, yeah, these molly soils, periglacial molly soils. Okay, well, it was good I didn't bet any money on that because it turned out to be not the case. Okay, this is here, these are four physical indicators, agriculture, aggregate stability, available water capacity, and penetration resistance, the hardness indicator, and four biological indicators, organic matter, active carbon, protein, and respiration. So organic matter is a standard um, indicator. Uh, active carbon, something that we worked on with Dave Wolf, is a uh, label carbon indicator. Protein, of course, is protein. We work with Janice Keith on that, and then respiration as well. And so what you see, so where it's green, it means that that region has statistically higher or more favorable numbers. Okay, so you see that the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic tended to have the best physical and biological conditions. Better than the Midwest, the only one that was good in the Midwest was available water capacity, which has more to do with the dominant textural class, uh, which is more silt loam and silty clay loam. So this is surprising. You look at organic matter, the Midwest had uh, about 3%, and along the East Coast, it had about 4%. That's 1% difference in organic matter. That's a lot, okay? The protein content was about double only the East Coast. So this is really surprising. So why is that? Why would you have that? Because, because conventional theory says it, it should be much better. Okay. So, but when you think about this, now these were just samples that came into our lab. So not a stratified sampling scheme or whatever, just whatever came. So but when you think about it, what comes into a lab from the Midwest is, is, is associated with corn and soybean row crop production. What comes into our lab from the East Coast is more livestock, more perennial crops like alfalfa, more organic farms, okay? 
So, but this is definitely surprising that soil health is basically better along the East Coast than in the central part. So that really kind of brought me to think about the spatial dimension of soil health, right? So we tend to think of soil health and soil forming factors as something that happens in situ, right? But as it turns out, there's a huge spatial dimension to that. And that's both natural and anthropogenic processes. And we're gonna explore those. Basically what it means is that there are areas of convergence where the basic soil health resources, which is primarily carbon and minerals, all right, are coming together in some area, but they're being lost in an area of divergence, okay? So when we think about historically, where are the areas where crop domestication occurred and we have had long and sustained food supplies, okay? So, um, and you would basically come up with this list, right? We know that from our introductory agronomy courses and all that. These are the areas where we had millennia of population growth and increased food production. How is that possible if we only have a limited bank of carbon and minerals, right? So what do these areas have in common? You might ask, I did ask that. Well, these areas are what we might call hydrobiogeochemical convergence areas. So I'm really exploiting the dictionary of the Greek language here. <laughs> Water, bio, life, and then geochemical, right? And so these are areas in a larger geographic region, a catchment, where these resources come together through natural processes, all right? Uh, water and whatever comes with water, what's dissolved in it, either coming from the surface or subsurface, ends up converging in streams. These streams converge into rivers. These rivers have floodplains and deltas. That's where some of this material gets deposited. So the sediment, the carbon, and the minerals that comes with that are all being concentrated in a relatively small area. And of course, the health of the soil in that area would then be much more favorable than what the areas where it's being lost, okay? So think about an erosional process, even under natural conditions, what's at the surface is the best part of the soil. And if that gets lost and you concentrate it somewhere else, that's very favorable. So when you look at, you know, uh, descriptions, here's carbon and nitrogen profiles of these aggrading soils that are on the receiving end of this, they have very favorable properties, of course. You know, oftentimes they're also physically very favorable because they tend to be silty type material. So one example of that is, of course, is the lower <coughs> Nile, Nile Valley. We know the history of that, millennia of, of cultures and population growth. But the catchment of the Nile really goes from the Mediterranean all the way down to uh, East Central Africa on the White Nile and Northeast Africa on the Blue Nile. And so basically the resources that come from that gigantic catchment end up really all concentrating in the lower Nile Valley. You get the water, you get the carbon, you get the minerals. Uh, and you have that in an area that's otherwise an extreme desert, right? So you have this localized area. And we know from history, from even from scriptures and all that, you know, what went on there in that lower Nile Valley. So millennia of sustained populations. Okay, um, so gradient soils, continuous mineral and organic matter additions, um, food surpluses that developed, of course. Um, you know, once you kind of figured out how to use certain plants to make crops out of them, they used emmer, wheat, and all that. That allowed you then for trade specialization, administrative hierarchies, armies, art, you name it. And of course, slavery, right? Agriculture has a very ugly history with slavery. But you know, you think about if you bring in slaves from other areas, right? You also need to be able to feed them. So you need to have a pretty good food surplus to be able to say, we're bringing other people in, we're gonna make them do the work so that we don't have to do it, okay? And, uh, and, we, and we feed them, okay? Um, not really a great part of our history, um, but it is all was facilitated by the fact that you had the sustained ability to create food, uh, notwithstanding the fact that there were famines, there were past problems, and things like that, um, in part related to climate fluctuations. 
Another interesting example is uh, the Valley of Mexico. So in central Mexico, there is a basin, um, and there used to be a lake there, that is in a volcanic region. Now, volcanic areas have naturally very fertile soil, you know, mafic rock material. And this is a geological basin, so it doesn't drain to the, to the ocean. And so you have a convergence there of mineral resources that in this case came to a very large lake. And so this, um, with that, you then had the development of these organic soils. So the minerals fed the crop, or the, 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 the production of marsh plants, which then build up. And so again, you have a huge bank account of minerals that sort of developed over the millennia. Now, uh, this area uh, is no longer a lake. And it's one of the largest cities in the world. It's Mexico City, right? And it has been drained now. Um, but naturally, in the uh, earlier years, this was the center of not only crop production, but of a very high civilization, right? This is an uh, impression of what the city of Tenochtitlan would have looked like right in the lake, with the pyramids and all that. And basically, the population was fed uh, from the marshes from this area which we refer to as the chinampas. So if you have marshland and you want to put it in production, so you have this wonderful uh, rich soil full of organic matter and minerals. The only problem is you can't grow some, many of the crops because you have water logging. So what do you do? You dig canals and you take the soil out of one area and you heap it up in another area. And now you mineralize that organic matter because you oxidize it now and you have the most productive soil you could ever imagine, okay? And so, um, but because these were marsh areas, there was this tremendous bank of, of carbon energy and mineral resources that, that went with that, okay? And that, you know, uh, sort of got some of the early crop domestication going here. Maize, beans, squash, you know that story. Uh, several large cities, not only Tenochtitlan, but also Teotihuacan, which you can now visit. Uh, still, it's a beautiful site if you haven't been there with the pyramids there. Uh, Tenochtitlan is now downtown Mexico City. There's like one little ruin left of that. Okay. Um, and as an aside, of course, um, the indigenous uh, population there, the Mexicas, uh, which is part of the Aztecs, um, were no-till farmers, right? They, uh, they didn't have any uh, draft animals or anything like that. And um, so they, they used planting sticks and they didn't really do any tillage. So they were way ahead of our time. Of course, when the conquerors came, they said to the indigenous population, you're doing it all wrong. You have to till the soil, right? And then they said, well, we don't have any draft animals. Well, guess what? You know, this is a beautiful mural by Diego Rivera at the Palacio Nacional. Definitely a place to visit um, because it shows again this, this story, the human factor around agriculture and, um, and um, you know, how that interrelates with the natural resources. So there are a number of other biogeochemical convergence zones that I think are notable. So one is Mesopotamia, of course, where the source of the water and the biogeochemical material is uh, primarily from Turkey. Um, the Indo-Gangetic Plain, right next to the orographically most active region in the world, the Himalayas, uh, constant supply of fresh minerals and carbon coming out of the mountains. Into, into the Gangetic Plain here and the Indus over there. And then the North China Plain and the Yangtze River Delta, uh, very similarly. So North China Plain is the Yellow River uh, estuary. And so these areas were continuously flooded, continuous supply of minerals and carbon that came from upper areas of the catchments. And so these areas became highly uh, populated because there was the opportunity for uh, for high uh, food production. Another interesting example is the country of Japan. Um, so Japan is a very mountainous country, you know, mostly volcanic. You know, I have earthquakes all the time. They just had one two weeks ago. Um, and then you have rel relatively limited areas here where you have these biogeochemical convergence areas. These are floodplains or coastal plains. Um, and, uh, but most of the country is, is very mountainous. And so you can't really grow any crops there, um, except in maybe some tiny little valleys. But so, so most of the 
the land or that is uh, that can that can produce crops is very intensively used. Okay, they don't really have a lot of space. They don't have a corn belt or anything like that. Okay, and um, so but again, these are biogeochemical convergence zones, and they allow for very intensive crop production. <coughs> and coming back home, we have that here in New York. Our best soils here in New York are in places like the Genesee Valley or the Schoharie Valley or so. These are, air, these are floodplain soils. They derive the resources from the entire country. So some of our best soils are in the Genesee Valley. They can compete with any soil in Iowa or any other place. Um, Eel, Genesee, Hamlin, these are the soils that are, are the best in the, in the state. Okay, so it's, it's everywhere. So what is happening to these ancient biogeochemical convergence zones? Well, you know, we look at the cities that I'm listing here that are now in these highly priced agricultural areas, right? So they've become very densely populated. Um, they uh, have the, the, the rivers have been channelized, so there's no more natural flooding because it's terrible. Flooding is terrible for the humans, but it's good for, it was good for the soil. Uh, the Aswan Dam was built here, so the whole idea of what happened in the Lower Nile Valley, that's out now, right? The Russians built that in the 1960s. But still very intensive crop production, now based on synthetic inputs. And some of the worst soil health degradation you might imagine, you see now in these areas that were naturally highly productive. So that brings me to, so we talked about biogeochemical convergence, but uh, us humans also have a big impact on that. So we might call it anthropogenic uh, biogeochemical concentration. But one very interesting example of that is if you go to Northwestern Europe, um, not too far from where I grew up, uh, and you see these uh, heath areas with heath vegetation, right? So it's interesting because heath is a pioneer species. So this area um, was glaciated, and so about 10,000 years ago, uh, we had an there's an opportunity for the invasion of various species. So heath is one of the first ones. Uh, but these soils in, in most of these areas are very poor, very sandy, uh, maybe moraine, outwash, whatever. And uh, so a lot of them are pot soils, um, very low, low inherent fertility. But there are these areas in the landscape, typically around some kind of a settlement, maybe a sheep barn or farmhouse, uh, where you have these fantastic soils or deep organic matter. And so that's maybe initially somewhat um, puzzling, but we call these soils plagen soils or in Germany, plagen ash soils. So a plagen is really kind of like a, like a cutting a sod, right? That's what that word means. So what's happening there is that, so first of all, it's somewhat surprising that you still have heath vegetation when it's a pioneer species. It would have been taken over by trees, right? Uh, but what the farmers did in that area, they concentrated the resources from a large area around their, their own farmstead, okay? What, what did they do? So you have this, the heath, they would cut the sod, maybe let's say 10 centimeters, so full of dense roots and a little bit of soil material. They would bring that to the farmstead. And in fact, they used it as bedding in the sheep barns. Then, they had a lot of sheep, and the sheep, of course, would be grazing all over the place uh, in the landscape, and they would be eating the, the vegetation. That's sheep actually eat heath okay. And then, of course, at night, you have to protect the sheep from the wolves and the foxes and all that. You bring them into the holding pen, the sheep barn, and they had the heath sod, the plug-in, as the bedding material. The sheep are there. What did they do at night? Well, one of the things that they do is they defecate and they urinate. So now you've got this nice mixture, kind of of a sort of composted material. Uh, you mix it with some of the ash and maybe char, and then you deposit that onto the soils around the farmstead. So now you had a very productive area around the farmstead that was basically the mining of resources from a much larger area. So it's kind of the same idea, this biogeochemical convergence into a smaller area. So it's just human ingenuity to create this system. And we know that there's other examples of that. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Terra Preta de Indios uh, soils because Johannes Lehman 
and his, uh, and his lab team have done a lot of work on that. There's a very interesting paper that just came out. It's actually, it's 2019 officially. It's just only available online that compares these soils. And so in the Terra Preta in Brazil, uh, it's more the char that seems to be providing some stabilization. With the plug-in soils, it's more the fact that they are in a more temperate climate, and so the organic matter decomposition is, is lower. Um, but uh, you know, throughout you know, history, there are these examples, because the Terra Preta soils are also basically an example of where people took resources from a larger area in the forest in this particular case, and then they brought them into a smaller area where they <coughs> were able to concentrate those resources. So I'm talking about biogeochemical convergence and gain areas, but of course there are also loss areas, right? So these are the areas in the catchment that do not benefit from having carbon and, and minerals coming from other areas. So these are the areas that are subject to erosion um, and leaching of, of, of these minerals. And so these are much more fragile areas. And we know, now know that it's very difficult to sustain crop production unless you start out with a fabulously natural, naturally fertile soil like the monosoils in, in the Midwest. So there's another pattern that has occurred over the past years, past millennium, centuries, I can say. In early agriculture, we had a strong integration of crops, primary producers, animals, the primary consumers, and humans, right? Uh, they lived all in the same area, typically on the same farm. Um, we saw with urbanization, we saw a separation of the crops and the animals from the humans. And so some of the, the minerals and the carbon did not get fully recycled, but most of them did get cycled around on a farm. Now with the commodification, good term by the way, Peter, I like that, uh, of, of agriculture, we've had a separation, increasing separation of the crops from the animals, from the humans, right? And this, from a biogeochemical perspective, creates some challenges because now we have <coughs> these concentrated livestock areas in this country and we are in one right now, or right here, okay? Central and Western New York are an epicenter for the dairy production and a lot of the uh, supplemental grains that come out of the Midwest that are being fed to these animals means that there's a surplus of carbon and minerals in these areas. Uh, similarly, Idaho, California, Delmarva Peninsula, poultry, Northwest Arkansas, and then Eastern Carolina and Virginia for, for hogs. These are areas where, um, where there's uh, a lot more animals than would not normally uh, be fed by the surrounding area. So basically what we have is a flow of minerals and carbon from the central crop production area in the country to these primary livestock producing areas, including upstate New York, okay, through these crops. So when you think of corn and soybean, think of biogeochemical material, think of soil health, because these are the materials that are fed to the animals and then come out the other end and are being used to improve the quality of the soil. So, of course, we know from our agronomy history and soil science history that we've had some technological developments over the past couple of hundred years, von Liebig, Laws, uh, Haber and Bosch, in the industrial capacity after World War II, where we now basically use synthetic uh, minerals to kind of resupply the losses that come from the soil, okay? If we hadn't done this, we would have really run out of minerals, okay? Um, so basically, what, that's what this map shows. So we're now, the major loss of minerals and carbon is from the central crop production area. So we're shipping phosphorus fertilizer from Florida, the Carolinas, Tennessee, Idaho, places like that. And a lot of the potassium comes from Saskatchewan and a lot of the nitrogen, because it's associated with natural gas, comes from uh, the uh, Gulf area. Okay, so we're resupplying the lost minerals by using artificial fertilizer, 
but what we are not resupplying is the carbon. So the, there's no biological component to this. We're just, we're just resupplying the, uh, the inorganic materials. So then you end up with a situation like this. So these are just two uh, soil health test reports that Bob Schindelbeck uh, uh, gave me, one from a Midwest grain farm and one from a, a Northeast dairy farm. And so here are the physical indicators, biological indicators, and chemical indicators. Let's ignore the chemical because it's all basically fertilizer and lime. But you can see that you know, the physical in and biological indicators of the Midwestern farm score pretty low. I mean, it's a lot of red and, and yellow, okay? Um, and you see that the Northeast dairy farm is mostly dark green, which means that it's very good. So for these soil health indicators, we're getting very good numbers. And that's, of course, because there's a lot of manure in the system and there's not here. What's interesting is the one that's red is phosphorus on the dairy farm because we downscore when the phosphorus levels are excessive, okay? So we have a, a problem of excess here with the uh, phosphorus. How many of you have seen this map? Okay, this map should be taught in every introductory agronomy sustainable agriculture course in the world. This map shows you the flows of grain and oilseed crops around the world, right? So when you see an arrow here, I want you to imagine that it's a flow of soil health. It's a, it's a flow of the basic resources of mineral and carbon that goes from one place to another, right? So where's, the, where's most of that coming from? The Americas, right? US, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, right? Where are most of it, of it going? To China, to Japan, maybe some to Korea, et cetera. Look at the blue arrows, which is soybeans, right? So if you follow the news, you know that with all the trade wars, the Chinese are saying, well, maybe we don't want to buy your soybeans anymore. So they're probably going to source it from the Brazilians, right? Um, so we export two thirds of our soybeans and half of that goes to China. So every third row of soybeans that you might see in a field in Iowa is going to go down the Mississippi River and, and to Iowa. So, but think of that as exporting soil health as well. Think of it as as the basic resources that maintains the health of the soil are being exported. Uh, note Japan here, uh, we actually <coughs> export a lot of uh, corn to Japan. And that is in support of their uh, dairy industry. This is a picture from Hokkaido. Sonam, where are you? You're gonna probably see this. Um, I visited Rintaro Kinoshita, my former student uh, there this summer. And you look at these dairy farms and you know, there's three barns, there's probably 120 <coughs> cows or something like that. And then you look at the amount of land that's there, it's like, wow, how can they possibly feed this many cows from this little land? Well, a lot of it gets imported from the United States. So we're building soil health in Japan, okay? And uh, so Hokkaido is here. This is where that picture was taken. And keep in mind, again, Japan, very mountainous country. And so these areas that are these naturally productive areas, it's all urban. This is, this is Tokyo, Yokohama. This is Nagoya. This is Osaka. It's all urbanized. The Japanese rely very heavily on the few remaining agricultural lands. And one way they can kind of facilitate this is by importing a lot of those grains and thereby importing <coughs> okay. And Japan is not the only one. Here's Korea, uh, my former home country. Uh, the Netherlands also import a lot, of, a lot of grain. And so in some of these countries, it's actually a big problem. They have problems uh, with uh, eutrophication in the estuaries, in their freshwater resources, et cetera. Now, similarly, a typical organic farm here in upstate New York is also a biogeochemical convergence zone because they very heavily rely on compost. The compost is derived from whatever leaf clippings or whatever from the, from the surrounding region. And so you're basically accumulating that onto a relatively small area, okay? Um, and some of these uh, organic farms are actually starting to have some problems with high phosphorus levels as well. Uh, here's an interesting example of biogeochemical convergence, and it's right here on campus. So this is the plant science building. This is the Mann Library. So Nina Basak in the horticulture department 
uh, every year with her class, she does kind of a renovation project, right? And so some of the landscaping uh, is just fantastic. It's beautiful. Uh, but the soil here on campus is not naturally that fertile. And uh, so what, uh, what Nina does is uh, she calls a scoop and dump. You, you come in, you put a lot of compost on the soil, then you kind of mix it in with, an, with a small excavator. And, um, and then, you know, you have this wonderful soil that comes out of that. So what's the source of the compost that's being applied? The dining halls here at Cornell, other sources as well, but let's, the, so the, the food residues. So where does that food come from? Well, maybe California, Idaho, Florida, Texas, whatever. All right, so think about that, that when you look at these little plants there in front of Mann Library, part of that came from California or Idaho or Texas or places like that. Okay, we're, we're kind of bringing together these basic resources of minerals and carbon and putting them in a place where we'd like them to be. Right, nothing wrong with that, it's just, <laughs> kind of interesting to ponder that, right? So we're now talking about peak phosphorus, right? So the idea of peak phosphorus, like peak oil, is like we're gonna be running out of phosphorus fertilizer. You know, the phosphorus mines in Florida and Idaho are starting to run out. Okay, oh, this is a problem, right? Well, is it really a problem? Are we losing a lot of phosphorus? A lot is just a reallocation problem. Right, so we've now, we're accumulating phosphorus on farms like here in central New York or in Eastern Carolina, places like that, right? And we're exporting them from places like Iowa and, and, and Illinois, All right? So the peak phosphorus problem is partially the structure of agriculture, right? That's kind of what creates this problem. It's not that we're running out of phosphorus, it's just that we're putting it in places where it's not of great use to us. While at the same time, having problems like here, algae growth in Owasco Lake, which is just north of here, um, because we have excess phosphorus, right? So one of the things that I think we need to think about is like, in a way, in New York, we are on the receiving end of a lot of great mineral resources and carbon and all that. It's just, we just pack it all into these livestock-based farms, mostly dairy farms, where it's a problem. We need to spread that around the world. Okay, I just wanna show you a few data results. I mean, we've done a lot of, of, of research and published a lot. I just wanted to show you, to give you a little bit of an upbeat sort of uh, end to this. This is a study from North Carolina where we collaborated with them. They did the, the cash test on a study that involves different tillage practices from very intensive tillage to minimum till. And what this shows you here, this is protein and yield. They had 16 years of yield data. It's a great data set. And it shows you two things. One is that um, as you reduce tillage, you increase the protein levels. Kind of makes sense because protein is a very labile form of carbon and nitrogen. So uh, if you till the soil, it will get very easily decomposed. Um, and so if you don't till the soil, you kind of build it up. But you also see that it has a very good relationship with yield. Right, so that's great. So you, uh, that's good news. You know, tell. So these are the other indicators that have significant correlations with yield. And I ranked them. Protein was highest, organic matter was the lowest. So you look at these R squared values, this is for mean yield, by the way, and you see the protein, active carbon, manganese, respiration had the highest correlations with yield. Organic matter was only eight. So total organic matter does not have as good of a correlation with yield as these labile sources of organic matter. Manganese, by the way, is involved with organic matter decomposition through a redox reaction, okay? So these are all associated with biological processes and labile sources of organic matter. Aggressibility is a physical indicator but we know is strongly related with biological processes. So we're starting to learn a lot about soil health and, 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 and what are important um, attributes of soil health. I'm gonna skip this because we're running out of time. <coughs> I wanted to show this as uh, 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 Rolly's slide. Uh, we're starting some work with, um, with Dan Buckley. Uh, so they are experts on microbial community analysis. And Rolly, I think you've analyzed about 500, 700 samples or something like that. 
that are coming through our lab and we take a little bit and we divert it to, to Dan Buckley's lab and Roly's been working on that. This is a very exciting new area. According to Dan, you can do these analyses for less than $20 and I think this is going to be an important part of the future. Okay. Conclusions, natural forces spatially impact soil health, right? So lower Nile Valley, Indo-Gangetic Plain, things like that. But anthropogenic forces are increasingly affecting the flow of carbon, which is energy, and nutrients, okay? And it becomes, it's, it's almost becoming the dominant process, okay? We have localized concentrations, maybe with a small organic farm, or dairy farms, and then we have these regional, national, and even global flows of the basic resources around soil health. And so the concept of regenerative agriculture or regenerative soil health management basically needs to recognize that situation. So knowing that, okay, what are some of the opportunities? What are some of the challenges? So one of them is to use good agronomic practices like reduced tillage, better rotation, cover crops, geographically reintegrating livestock and crops. And also to think more deeply about harvesting these nutrients in the organic matter. The idea that we have such a problem with excess nutrients and carbon on these dairy farms here and that we have other parts of the state where the soils are starving for carbon and nutrients, okay? Is there something, can we be a little bit more creative about that? So maybe that means processing some of that manure. Maybe, you know, Johannes is very interested in pyrolyzing or maybe torrefaction, which is drying. Maybe other ways to process that manure and make it logistically feasible to spread these resources around a little bit more. So I kind of wanted to stimulate that kind of thinking because I think uh, in uh, New York we have that opportunity to, um, to solve some of these problems. But first you need to understand the source of that problem, right? Which is very structural, very economically driven. Okay, with that, I already went a little bit over time. So uh, thanks very much. It's just really, thanks for coming. So the question is, you know, whether anaerobic digestion impacts sort of all these, these processes. So, and, and I'm not an, an expert uh, in that area, but basically what you're trying to do there is, is, is capture some of the energy as methane, which you could also capture in other ways. You could capture it um, <coughs> through pyrolysis, you could capture it uh, through direct combustion. Um, there's, there's many ways, ways to do that. Um, I, I think that, you know, it doesn't necessarily solve this problem. It, it is just, a, this, it is a processing of the manure um, that still uh, retains the excess nutrients. You reduce the carbon a little bit, but it doesn't necessarily in a structural way, unless you take the resi residual material and you put it, you take it off the dairy farm or off the livestock. So in terms of this bigger picture problem, it, it's not necessarily a solution. That's why I'm saying we need to maybe think about, see, a big part of the problem with manure is the bulkiness, right? It's difficult to, to, to transport, transport. Another issue is sort of pathogens. Um, so if we can kind of address some of these constraints um, and we can find ways to spread it around, for example, dried manure would be much easier to transport over somewhat longer distances. Right? So if, even if you can get the manure 10 miles out from the farm, right? it would do a tremendous amount of benefit, both in terms of reducing the problem on the livestock farm <coughs> and helping the, the, the land um, off the livestock farm. But actually, you know, um, one of Peter Woodbury is a real, uh, real expert on this idea of, you know, processing of manure, especially uh, digestion. So he would be able to answer that probably better than me. Yeah. Comparing or contrasting maybe uh, like from these, like the dairy farms and like Midwest farms, um, you seem to focus on the 
Well, yeah, I mean, in a way, these are very gross generalizations, right? I mean, there, there are lots of livestock farms in, in the Midwest. There's a lot of hog farms, also um, egg farms, et cetera. So it, it, is, it is a gross uh, generalization. Um, so the, you know, here in the, in the Northeast, when we use perennials, especially perennial legumes, or maybe even cover, you know, cover crops are a relatively small solution to this bigger problem, but they're, they're potentially useful. So yes, I mean it. it uh, but but the the legumes primarily relate to nitrogen, and so it doesn't necessarily relate to the other nutrients. But your point is well taken in that you know we can grow some of that carbon here, right? So and they can grow some of that carbon in places like Iowa by using better rotations, uh, bringing in cover crops and all that. So um, you can use those basic minerals uh, resource even if they're synthetic and you can still build up the soils if you use better rotations and better cropping systems, right? And so that's what, that's one part of that solution, right? Yes, Peter. And just to chime in on that, I mean, you know, Harold mentioned the legume is getting exported around the world, right? So it's yeah. not that there are any legumes in Iowa, it's just shipping them to China, right? So it's, I think there really is a mass balance issue here yeah. Uh, thanks so much for your talk and also for discussing slavery. This is a part of Bible book. I feel like that's a, a portion that doesn't necessarily get mentioned in this room quite a lot. But I think it's important that we don't think of it as a passive thing, as history. It's still very much ongoing. There are lots of people that have labor issues and very exploited the process of it today. I, I would agree with that. We, I mean, the the effects of slavery that happened in the past and the and, and the current structure of agriculture that um, is maybe not uh, labeled as slavery, but it's still um, a very unequal. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's no, and, and, and I, I agree. I, and that's why I bring it up. I think I think we need to have it's something that we tend to sort of uh, sweep under the rug a little bit. But agriculture is the primary, has been the primary economic activity associated with slavery or, or sort of unequal treatment of, of people. And I think to, it's good for us to sort of talk about what's our, what were sort of some of the uh, underlying driving factors that were associated with that. And people had slaves basically because they could uh, in the ancient world. And, uh, and they, again, this, this is a sequence. You, you have ample food production. You know, think about an expeditionary force. You know, like you can read about it in the historical document in the, in the scriptures where armies would go out <laughs> and they would capture other people. Well, first of all, you need to be able to, to sustain an army, which is a logistical challenge even today. And, uh, and then you needed to bring those people back and you needed to feed them and enslave them. And, and so it, it, it was a very sort of devious sort of set of, of actions that sort of created that situation. And uh, you know, many millennia later, we actually transported people across the ocean for the same purpose and now we you might argue that there's some issues around the labor that we use in agriculture this uh, uh, these days right and uh, that has also to do with the structure of agriculture that everything has to be cheap and uh, so this we can talk about that for i'm not an expert in that area but i think it is important that we have, have you know that we are um, honest about that that's part of what we do Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Carol. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web, 
at cornell.edu.